Now there are several, actually several different progressions of difficulty that you need to take into consideration when you're choosing what to introduce to the child. Now some of the things like math, there's actually a pretty small content area. It's numbers and a bunch of stuff you do with them. <laughs> you slip, split them apart, you put them together in different ways, but your whole content is actually the numbers, okay? So there's, there's not a whole lot of content area there. Other areas of the classroom are more content intensive, and so you've got to, to approach them a little bit differently. Math is the simplest because it's just the passage to abstraction. It, that's the only progression that you really need to look at besides just easiest to hardest. You know, you're, if, if you're teaching multiplication, you're not going to start off with um, 3,000 21.6 times, you know, 200.2 because it, it, it's, you're, you're going to start with something that's very, the con, you're, you're going to keep the content simple if the process is new. You're going to keep the process simple if the content is new. So that, that that's how we keep things easiest for the child to understand. We actually have a name for it in Montessori. It's, it's inherent in many of the, of the materials. Do you know what we call it? How come all of our letters are only pink and red instead of rainbow colors? To isolate the difficulty or to isolate the new concept. That's what the reasoning is. We don't have an alphabet puzzle that's got all sorts of different colors of the alphabet because then is it a letter that says B or is it a green? because the next one's blue, and the next one's yellow, and the next one's orange, how would you know which, which one it was? So we're going to isolate the difficulty. So in math, that's really all you need to take into consideration, is don't have your manipulatives multicolored when the children are still focusing on understanding the simple quantity. All of the spindles are identical. All right? We start introducing color with those unifix cubes because we already have the counting down. It's not, a new, it's not a new concept anymore. The idea of 1 through 10 is an old concept by the time they're using those little bars of, of the unifix cubes. It starts with concrete to abstract, then it goes whole to parts, and then it goes child to world. Now when you start doing things like teaching geography and teaching the other cultural subjects such as botany and zoology, you're going to need to take all of these things into consideration and sometimes they are at odds with each other. Because if you're going to go whole to parts when you're teaching the geography of the world, you're going differently than if you're going child to world. Let, let me give you a concrete example of that one, and then we'll start walking through all of those different progressions. If you're going whole to parts, you're starting here. This is the whole world. Now, you can go bigger and start with the universe, but this is a logical whole to begin with in geography of the earth. This is the earth. But to a three-year-old, is this going to have all that much meaning? One of the key aspects of geography is the whole idea of the passage to abstraction. In order to represent the whole world, we, we can't be concrete. We're standing on the concrete representation, and it's impossible to even tell what shape it is because it's so big. So a representational concrete, um, a concrete representational model like this is essential for us to understand even what the world is. But this is a long way from the child. If we're going child to world, then we can't start with this. If we're going child to world, we're going to start with standing out there, this is you, this is earth. Everything you can see is earth. Okay, that's starting child to earth. And then we've got to start going representational or we can't get to this, much less the maps or the map puzzles or, or anything else like that. So how do we move into representation if we're going child to world? Well, we start with something that they can see the representation and the thing. We might make a map of this room. And then they can actually touch the table on the map and they can touch the table in the room. That's child to world. That's not whole to parts. Mm -hmm. Could we be doing both of them at around the same time? Mm -hmm. Yes. And with something like geography, we should. We need to be going in all of these different directions. Now, does it make pretty much sense to you why we do concrete to abstract 
is that pretty self-evident why we're always going to want to, as much as we can, give the child something that's, that's as close to reality as possible to start with, and then move to the things that are just uh, an agreed upon reality, such as W-O-R-L-D, representing this. Does that make sense to everyone? So let, let's look at that passage to abstraction with something other than math. Concrete to abstract. The first thing we can start with is earth, water, and air. We can literally have a little container or empty containers in which the child can physically put earth, clean potting soil, dirt, <laughs> in one of them, water from the faucet in another one, and then we usually have to explain to them is all you have to do is open the lid for it to be filled with air, or the very fact that there's nothing else there means it's filled with air. Now, which of those is going to be the hardest for the child to understand? Air. Yeah. Why? You can't see it. You can't see it. Okay. So could we make it visible? Mm -hmm. Yes, we could. Mm -hmm. We could take a glass and put it in a goldfish bowl or something like that, and then pour the water around the bowl, pour the water around the glass. So what we've done is we've trapped air. If we can have a clear glass, but that makes a pretty good seal, so like one of the glasses like we have the the paintbrushes in would probably be ideal because plastic is going to tend to seal a little bit better and trap the air a little bit better. So then we can actually say, see, there's air in there. You can't see it? Well, watch this. We tip the glass and then the air has to come through the water to escape back into the room. And so then the child is able to see air in as much as we can. So is this making sense how sometimes we're going to have to be a little clever and a little manipulative of the environment to make it as concrete as we can? Yeah. Then, now we move into landforms and miniatures. Hard to bring the Great Salt Lake <laughs> into the classroom. Is this, oops, Antelope Island. Is this going to make what a lake and what an island are much clearer than if all we did was show it, even in a picture form, or talk to the child about it? Very much so. So the way that we work with these is all we do is we pour water in and see how they have a little lip so that when you pour it out, the child is able to, um, to actually create a tiny lake, create a tiny island surrounded by water and actually see that that's what it is. Now actually it makes it pretty to have the blue in the bottom, but is there water in here already? No. So I might not have made that blue um, to start. That's one of those things that I consider to be splitting hairs <laughs> and it doesn't really matter. I had, I had a question in another training, well do you think we should paint these blue? I said given that they're not, no. But if they were already blue, would I tell you to change it? No. <laughs> it's because it's not that important. Look at this. There's weight to it. You can, can hold an island, okay? You can stick your hand down into the lake. When it's filled with water, you can poke your, your hand in there. You could take a set of miniature objects and put boats in the water and put... Um, cars on the island or on the land. You could hold a parachuter up in the air above it and, and represent how the earth, air, and land really do interact in, in the world. So then this is our, does it make sense now how we're passing to the abstract in a little different, um, okay? There you go. Now, if I don't speak English, mm -hmm. is it still going to make sense? that this is this is Antelope Island? It is, isn't it? We don't have to have a shared reality. This is representational, but that's one of the ways to tell whether or not you're at the concrete end of representational, or if you're at the abstract end of representational, okay? Because right, actually this is completely abstract, but if I were to have this with lake underneath it, then what I'm doing is kind of concrete Make representational because you're mixing the, the two of them up. If someone who doesn't even know the same language as you is going to represent is going to be able to recognize it, then it's fairly on it's fairly far on the concrete side of the representational. If it's three dimensional, it's farther along. So this is more concrete than this is. So is that kind of making that clear to you? Mm -hmm. So then. 
How about this? <laughs> this is very representational, all right? Because if I put this with this, if I put this with this, it's pretty obvious. You know, this is one small set of things that represents this. Where on earth is this and this, okay? You're, you're making quite, quite a leap there. And if you look at that chart that I gave you, so we go, the actual earth, there's, that's absolutely concrete. Earth is earth, water that comes out of the faucet is water, so we're absolutely concrete. And if you look at the bottom of your page, you'll see concrete, concrete representational, abstract representational abstract. So we're at absolutely concrete at the top of that chart. Then landforms, we're very concrete representational. We're 3D, and someone who doesn't know our language would definitely understand it. Then when we go to objects from different countries, we're actually kind of concrete and representational. I mean, uh, what's the little doll from Russia that's oh. nested? Matreshka? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Babushka. Well, the bush is a star. Yeah, that's the. What's the what is Matryoshka. The name of it? Matryoshka. Okay. Matryoshka. So that's the little nested dolls. That there's a big one and there's a smaller one in it and a smaller one in it like that. That's a real toy from Russia. There's nothing representational about that, but it represents another part of the world. So it is both concrete and representational. If we had a box of objects from Russia, which we probably will, because I have a few things from there, then we have something that is both concrete and representational that the children can use. Then when they look at Russia on the globe or on the, the world map, then they're able to make that relationship a little bit more. Photos are more concrete than the drawings. The drawing is more concrete than the word labels, and by the time you get to words, you're in abstract. But even within words, there's levels of abstraction. If it's one word that you can then show something exactly, then it's much easier for the child moving through that passage to abstraction to get than if you've got definitions. But if you're matching a definition, that's much easier than having to state it. Tell me what this is. Well, it's an island. Define an island. That's much harder than just matching what's something that's already given to you. And then compose a story about, compose a story in which an island is a key part of your, your plot. So are, is, the, is this passage making more sense now? Okay. So everybody, does everybody feel pretty comfortable with that particular progression of difficulty? So now let's go hold to parts. We did that a lot in math, didn't we? And that was pretty obvious. Now in math, what you want to do is you want to start with the whole and break it into parts. So you start with a unit, and then you break it into smaller pieces. You're not going to start with fraction, usually. But with math, bouncing back and forth is really important with whole to parts. So we have the whole of a 7, and then we have uh, unifix cubes that make it clear that whole is made up of 7 units. Whole is 7, parts are 7 individual units. With some of these other things, we're mainly going to just travel in, in one direction in terms of the order that we present things. So, hold to parts number one is world travel. We have quite a few children in, in this particular school that, that actually have that as a reference point. So you're going to want to know that. You're going to want to know where those children have already traveled. You're going to want to know if they have experience of different continents so that you can make reference to that when they're here, particularly children in the older classroom. Now, a three-year-old, you know, how do they know the ocean in California different than the ocean in the Mediterranean? Not so much. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not going to make that much difference to them. But the children that can remember the plane trip and who, when they came back, we, we traced the plane trip from this country to, to here for them around the globe, that's going to have some meaning to them. But the globe of land and water. This is the whole broken up into only its most essential parts. And now when I do the globe of land and water, I do the globe of land, water, and air. One of the things that, that is, is about the, the Montessori environmental mission um, is, is that the children have an awareness that's going to support them being environmentally responsible. If every time they see this, it's the water, the land, and the air, 
then the air is going to be part of their consciousness. You can't see it. So if we include that every time we're working with those parts, that's just going to become part of what they are going to scan for. How do I protect our water? How do I protect our land and its inhabitants? How, and the water and its inhabitants and the air and its inhabitants. How do I, how do, I do that? Right. So then this is less essential parts, still very few. And why is this more abstract, even if it were only broken into two parts? Well, you've got all of the other things to find, the continents are defined. Well, how, color. how were these divisions come up with? Did God do these? No, human beings. <laughs> human <laughs> beings did these. So, this so is so agreed so upon. Okay. Now it's. I mean, it's pretty physical. But but why is the why does the color change right there? This is land, and this is land. Mm -hmm. We decided it was mm -hmm. going to change right there. So this is more agreed upon. It, it, did anyone have to agree that this is fundamentally different than this is than this is? No. That's that's shared reality, independent of cultural agreement. We're starting to introduce cultural agreements here. This is North America because we call it North America, and for no other, no other reason than that. So then, oh, and I forgot to bring it again. Um, have I shown you all the ball that I, some of you were there when I showed the children that I, I had a ball that I cut in half, and then I smushed it, and we made it as flat as we could make it, and we could only get it so flat. Were any of you here for that lesson? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. So our cameraman was here for, for that lesson, but nobody else was. What, what I did is I just took a cheap ball from, from Target or something, and I just cut around one of its seams. And what we did is we flattened it, and I had the other children help me get it as flat as they could possibly get it. Well, you can only get it so flat. So, so what using that ball does is it represents for the child how we get from here to here. And that we cannot do so perfectly. When we try to flatten that ball, it was very obvious to everyone that you could never make something that was inherently this shape into this shape and make it perfectly representational. If any of you have seen the maps where Antarctica looks, you know, humongous, <laughs> it's because of the way that the projection was done to try and deal with the problem of changing a three-dimensional sphere into a two-dimensional rectangle. You cannot do it perfectly, and so you have to choose how you're going to distort. All representation includes distortion. Do you know how many adults that has been a life-changing understanding for? Every time, well, have you ever heard the, the thing about the relationship between eyewitness testimony and the game of telephone? You, do, you, do you all know the game of telephone? Where you, 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 you whisper to one person and he or she whispers to the next one and you go around the room. And if you've got more than four people that the message goes through, oh my goodness, when the last person says it, it has very little relationship to the first <coughs> thing that was said. Same thing with eyewitness testimony. The, the longer it's been and the more people you have, the less clarity there seems to be. Why? We live from our representations. Right. We do not live from reality. You can't. You live in a world of representations. <laughs> you don't live in the Kalahari, where all life is, is what you're touching and gathering and preparing to eat or preparing to kill or preparing to stay in. You live in a world of representations. And to actually have the children get at a very early age that distortion is inherent in representing something is a huge learning. Huge learning in terms of their social well-being. The reality you have will never be the reality of your four-year-old sister. Never, ever, ever. She will forever and eternally live in a different world than you do because she distorts it differently than you do. Because she lives in a different physiology. Just like you've seen five or six different maps of this same location that look completely different because of the way they chose to distort it, that is inherently the way that we work in this world. So does this make sense how, you know, it's not just about teaching the kids the continents. <laughs> it's about teaching something much more important. We go, um, we go from the continent to the world map puzzle. And now 
we're hitting the landforms. Why? Because we're going to smaller parts. Now, in some ways, there's a whole bunch of these in the world, but this is also just the idea of land surrounded by water, which is what we've just been teaching with these different materials. Then we go into the continent map puzzles, so we're going into smaller and smaller parts, country map puzzles, like the map of the United States that we have. Now, we don't have a, a, a map of Utah puzzle, but that now we would come into a state map and a city map, etc. And see, I don't even continue the progression because it's the opposite of the next progression, the child of the world. Mm -hmm. Does this make sense? And does it make sense why we're starting here at the same time that we're starting with the map of the classroom? Because we're, we're getting into them and where they live from two different directions. Time outside is the start with the child of the world, Earth. You, you, Earth, <laughs> okay? That's where my, my grandbaby is. <laughs> this is Earth, this is you. This is water, this is you, okay? Because he doesn't know, you know, that it's different at this point. A map of the classroom, a map of his room with little shelves on it. Here's where these, here's your closet. That would be completely appropriate, not now, but soon. Um, or I spy, because for him, it's not appropriate. He has absolutely no capability of abstracting whatsoever. He doesn't even know that he and his mom are different. <laughs> not really. He's beginning, you know, he's almost two, so he's kind of starting to get that. But that's not even completely clear to him. So this represents something? I don't think so. So instead of doing that, we do I spy. I spy a closet. I spy a floor. I spy a table. Are we starting to get a representation of our environment and that it's got names and things like that? Yeah. Then a map of the school, a map of the town, a map of the state. Now, can we, can we mix some of this up a little bit? Could we have, um, uh, what do you call the maps that are actually raised? Um, relief? Relief maps. Can we have relief maps so that we've got a little bit of the progression of child out to world and a little bit of the, the concrete that's mixed in there? Absolutely. Local land water feature visits, taking him to Antelope Island or Willard Bay or, or Utah Lake and, and saying, yeah, this is a lake. This is a lake. So do you see how these progressions are kind of fitting together? Then map of the country, map of the continent. So can you see how the child of the world and the whole of the parts are almost in verses, but you're going to be starting at the top of each of them and, and moving down. Okay. Well, you may have noticed that when I was preparing for this next segment, I found my ball. Okay, so this is what, just a cheap ball. I, you know, I happen to pick one that kind of looked like it had some oceans on it, not any land. But what I do is I just bring it out and I ask the children, now, what happened to this? Well, the air is gone, yes. <laughs> do you notice anything else? It's cut in half. And then we start trying to flatten it out. Now, do any of you now have a better understanding of why the map looks like it does? <laughs> okay? And is this more meaningful to you than just me telling you about it earlier today? Yeah. One of the beauties of the Montessori approach is the use of concrete objects to help a child grasp abstract ideas such as mathematical concepts, grammar concepts, and geographical realities too large to actually see. Montessori explains the importance of these aids. They loved the globe so much that it became the most popular feature of their room. The child's mind between three and six can not only see by intelligence relations between things, but it has the higher power still of mentally imagining those things that are not directly visible. Imagination has always been given a predominant place in the psychology of childhood. Yet, when all are agreed that the child loves to imagine, why do we give him only fairy tales and toys on which to practice this gift? If a child can imagine a fairy and fairyland, it will not be difficult for him to imagine America. Instead of hearing it referred to vaguely in conversation, we can help him clarify his own ideas of it by looking at the globe on which it is shown. We often forget that imagination is a force for the discovery of truth. Maria Montessori in The Absorbent Mind, page 177. 
In previous episodes, we introduced our viewers to two major Montessori organizations, Association Montessori International and its affiliated group, North American Montessori Teachers Association, as well as the American Montessori Society. Along with these organizations, we highly recommend the resources of the Montessori Foundation for anyone seeking to understand and use Dr. Montessori's amazing ideas. As with segments in our first five episodes, this segment was filmed at the 2013 International Montessori Congress in Portland. I'm here at the International Montessori Congress with Margot Garfield Anderson, and she is going to help us understand what the Montessori Foundation can do for you as a Montessorian. Thank you. The Montessori Foundation was created to be a support system to schools, parents, organizations to help perpetuate the philosophy and teachings of Maria Montessori. It's best illustrated what we do by looking at our beautiful graphic of a tree with the many limbs of what we cover. The top of the tree, or the sky, is what the Montessori Foundation headline is. On the tree, we have many different branches or services. For instance, Tomorrow's Child Magazine is a quarterly publication sent to all schools in the United States and Canada, one copy complimentary, the rest in bulk order and individual subscriptions, helping parents and teachers learn more about Montessori around the world. The Center for Montessori Leadership is an online vehicle to help administrators and assistants learn how to be effective leaders in their environment. The bookshelf, which we represent here at the Montessori Congress, has a listing of about 70 different books, many of which are published and written by the Foundation, that are wonderful resources for parents and schools about Montessori, including the Montessori Way, How to Raise an Amazing Child, The World in the Palm of Her Hand, and of course, Paul Epstein's An Observer's Notebook. Then we have the Peace Academy. The Montessori Foundation, in partnership with its membership organization, the International Montessori Council, runs two annual conferences, one in Sarasota, Florida, where we are headquartered, in November of each year, the other in San Jose, California, in the spring. This is a conference that concentrates on community, peace education, and best practices. The International Montessori Council, as I just mentioned, is the membership wing of our organization. This is true support at a very low cost for schools and leaders of Montessori schools who are interested in remaining as pure and true to Montessori as possible. We also specialize in school accreditation, um, especially at the international school level. We have several schools overseas that are now accredited through us, and we are looking at several more completing the process this year. You also, with your membership, get a subscription to Montessori Leadership, which is a professional journal that is especially focused on very quick solutions for administrators for very common situations that happen in schools. Then we have board development. Tim Selden, as everyone knows, um, is an expert in many different areas, but specifically in how to run boards and how to turn boards that might not be kind at the moment to their heads of school into working to find peace peaceful solutions on all levels of board development. We also run seminars and retreats for boards. Finally, we do school consultations. We have a group of very dedicated Montessorians that we rely on to go to schools or work by Skype or even go to meetings consultations, some of which are included in your IMC membership at the school level, but also paid consultation, and this is for uh, 
pre-accreditation visits, setting up elementary programs, going to the next level of whatever the program is, or helping you conquer some of the obstacles that many Montessori administrators face. So as you can see, all the branches of the tree make for a very full tree for the Montessori Foundation to help you and yours with whatever your needs could possibly be. Thank you, Margot.